Good morning, everyone. Let's get started. Thank you so much for joining us for this very special presentation. Um, this is called well, um, Equity and Historic Preservation, Telling America's Full Story. We're so glad you're here. And um, I just want to introduce our very esteemed guest speaker, Brent Legs. He's the Executive Director of the African American Cultural Heritage Action Fund with the National Trust for Historic Preservation. Thank you so much for, for being here. Uh, my name is Danielle Del Sol. I'm the Executive Director of the Preservation Resource Center, and we're thrilled to have you all joining us today uh, for this special presentation. So as many of you who are local know, today is a very special day in New Orleans. It's Give NOLA Day. And it's a day where organizations across the city ask for your support um, through the Greater New Orleans Foundation. You can give at givenola.org and any amount helps because the Greater New Orleans Foundation actually has bonus prizes. So even when you donate $10 to a bunch of your favorite charities, that puts those charities in the running for extra money. So any amount that you're able to donate to the Preservation Resource Center will truly help us today. As many of you know, we are a 47-year-old nonprofit dedicating to saving, dedicated to saving New Orleans historic architecture, neighborhoods, and cultural identity through collaboration, empowerment, and service to our community. Um, the work that we do throughout the year is wholly reliant on the generosity of our funders. For those of you who are familiar with us, you know the work that we do. You get our magazine in your mailbox every month, you attend our classes, um, you see the work we're doing out in the community. For those of you who are not familiar with the work of the PRC, let me just tell you a few of the things that we are known for in New Orleans. We advocate um, at the city, state, and federal levels to save buildings from unnecessary demolition and to support legislation that protects historic places. We give free repairs to low-income homeowners um, through our Revival Grants program. We host classes throughout the year on purchasing, renovating, and maintaining historic buildings. Everything from how to use historic tax credits to picking the right contractor to how to decorate a shotgun. Um, we, pr we produce an award-winning magazine preservation in print nine months out of the year. And we have incredible social media accounts to inform and inspire people um, and their love of New Orleans historic architecture. We host home tours. We have we hold stewardship over 130 easements. So we protect um, over 130 historic properties across Louisiana um, forever. That's our job. Um, and we do, we do much more. So I hope that you will consider supporting the PRC today in our Give NOLA Day fundraising efforts. Um, before we get started, I just want to explain how this webinar works. For those of you who are watching via Zoom, you can submit questions to Brent. Um, and so you can do that either by clicking the chat box or the Q&A box. I'll monitor both of those as we go along and we'll try and um, stop our conversation 10 to 15 minutes before the noon hour. Um, if you're watching in central time for Brent, it'll be the one o'clock hour so that we can um, ask some of the questions that you all have. So feel free to submit those through the chat or Q&A button at any point um, during our conversation. Um, so we have set a Give NOLA Day goal of $30,000 and we are pretty much halfway there. We, we're just about to surpass 15,000. So please help us meet that goal, givenola.org. I wanna thank the Pinkalot Foundation and Mrs. Ann Masson. They provided generous matching gifts that allowed us to match dollar for dollar the first $6,000 that we raised today. So thanks so much to both. Um, and so, like I said before, all of our work is wholly dependent on the generosity of our members, our donors, and our grantors, including the National Trust, which is one of the most, most important allies that we have in the work that we do. So, since we're talking about the National Trust, let me please introduce our very esteemed guest today, Brent Legs. Like I said, he is the Executive Director of the African American Cultural, Action, Cultural Heritage Action Fund. Um, and Brent's work has for years included this, the preservation of incredible sites of significance across the country, including Joe Frazier's gym in Philadelphia, um, Madam C.J. Walker's estate in New York and others. Um, Brent is a faculty at um, UPenn, is that right, Brent? Um, yeah. And the University of Maryland, is that right as well? So used to teach at University of Maryland, I am now at University of, of Penn and a senior advisor to their new center on the preservation of civil rights sites. Amazing, wow. Um, and you were also a Loeb Fellow 
And you also uh, co-authored a work that the Smithsonian Institute called the Seminal Publication on Preserving African-American Historic Sites, which was Preserving African-American Historic Places. And that was in 2012. So Brent, it, I'm not exaggerating when I say you are somewhat of a rock star and I am very, very honored <laughs> that you are uh, spending an hour with us today. So thanks so much for being here. Yeah, I'm glad to be with you. So um, for those who aren't completely familiar with the history of your fund, the fund that you now direct, can you take us through um, how the trust dreamed up the cultural act, the African American Cultural Heritage Action Fund? Um, the, you know, the origins of the fund and how you all grew it and to make it real. Yeah. So I'm going to say the name, the six word name once, and then we'll call it Action Fund after that. And I did not name it. So <laughs> <laughs> good plan. Yeah. So the African American Cultural Heritage Action Fund was born in the aftermath of Charlottesville. And this was in 2017. And we remember those events in the summer. That was a, a moment of cultural reckoning. And it also was one of these rare moments where historic preservation was part of a national discourse. Mm. And not only historic preservation, but the conflict between public space and heritage. And I remember seeing, you know, the, the white men who look like our neighbors in khaki pants and polo you know, shirts and holding tiki torches rallying around a Thomas Jefferson sculpture on the campus of UVA. And it was clear that they were advocating for modern form of Jim Crow mm -hmm. and stuck both in a, in a painful past and were leveraging public space, mm -hmm. monuments and, and heritage to advocate for inequity and justice. So we didn't think that this really reflected our national values or our organizational values at the National Trust. And so our response was to begin the process of telling the full American story, confronting the miseducation of Americans that we saw and, and, and who I just described. Mm -hmm. And we wanted to express that a different segment of society can express our cultural values in public space in a totally innovative and inclusive way. And thus the Action Fund was born, initially set out as a five-year, $25 million campaign to support the preservation interpretation of 150 Black history sites in the U.S. And I'm glad to say that we have completed in record time in just over three years, we completed phase one. We've raised almost a little more than $28 million. <laughs> we have crossed the, the major outcome of 150 projects. Wow. And I'm finalizing the strategic plan for 2.0. Oh, congratulations. That's absolutely Thank you. Amazing. Yeah. I'm so heartened that, that so many um, organizations saw the same vision, were as horrified as the trust was by what was happening and committed their money to changing the narrative with you all. That, that gives me hope. <laughs> it is, and major organizations. And I think for me, what's most inspiring about the impact of the Action Fund, it shifted the organizational culture at the National Trust and moved us warp speed towards a new cultural ethic that's yeah. centered on equity and justice. Yes. But to be able to see our partners like the Ford Foundation, the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, the JPB Foundation and others invest significant money to realize the action fund and understanding the the, the deep rooted impacts of historic preservation. Mm -hmm. So it's a really exciting moment for us as professionals and practitioners, when you have traditional philanthropy reimagining their own investment to help expand the American story. Yes, gosh, that's, it really is, like you said, an amazing moment to, to finally have the work that preservationists do uh, be part of um, a national narrative. That is not 
that is not common. And, and really in this time that has been so divisive, we see a true, um, true meaning in our work. Um, mm. Telling the full American story means, um, means healing, means equity. Um, and it's, it makes what you all are doing so vital. So you've already surpassed the 150 project mark, but from what I understand, the need is really great. I mean, mm -hmm. in terms of the number of applications, were you all completely overwhelmed or, or how, did, how did that work? <laughs> yeah, so one of the, the, as you know, as a grantee, but one of the signature pillars of the Action Fund is our national grant program. Mm -hmm. And yes, we were overwhelmed in the first year when we invited proposals. So we launched the Action Fund, then we launched the National Grant Program, Invite Proposals. First year, we received more than 800, requesting almost 90 million. And we had 1.1 million to, to invest in a small cohort of, of projects. And we invested in, in 16 in the inaugural year. Across four grant rounds, we've received almost 2,300 proposals requesting almost $243 million. Oh my gosh, wow. And I'm grateful that we have invested in 65 preservation projects across the United States and invested at almost 5 million, to be exact, 4.3. And thanks to our partnership with the Mellon Foundation, we'll invest in our fourth cohort this July uh, at $1.6 million. Okay. But these numbers, they affirm and communicate that African American historic places have been underfunded and undervalued for decades. Mm -hmm. yeah. So a lot of the, the work of the Action Fund and partners like, like yourself, this is rescue work. We, we're trying to catch up from the years of an equitable recognition, investment, which has left many African historic places in vulnerable states of condition, deferred maintenance, you know, literally standing on a, on a last pillar because of all of the years of decay. So I, I, I see what we do as both rescue work beyond the importance of being, you know, the storytelling and, and, and understanding our, our full history. Yeah, yeah. Um, for those of you watching, um, if Brent um, mentioned that we are, are a partner with them. Um, we were very blessed to receive um, funding from the Action Fund two years ago to launch our Revival Grants program, where we are focusing on the Treme neighborhood, which has been particularly hard hit with uh, raising property values and tax property taxes. Um, where families who um, have been there for generations, many of whom have had to leave, those who are managing to hang on, we wanted to do what we could to help them stay in their neighborhoods, keep that generational wealth, keep their history and their cultural identity by staying in the neighborhood where they, where they love, what they love. Um, and so, you know, our kind of ethos was there's many, many factors at work uh, to displace residents in this neighborhood and historic preservation should not be one of them. Mm -hmm. The problem was that people were being fined because the Treme neighborhood is a full control historic district in New Orleans. And so if there's any sort of deterioration or neglect on the property, homeowners were being fined. And so not only did they have a home that needed repairs that they could not afford, then they also had city fines that they could not rectify. And they were being forced to go to the city every year and basically plead poverty, say, I can't afford to fix my house. And the city would grant them another year, another 18 months to fix their property. But everyone knew full well that for low-income homeowners who are in this situation, they're on a fixed income. They need to pay to live and to they need to pay for things like food and medicine and transportation. And so, um, you know, we what we did was we devised this program where we are using their city violations. These homeowners, um, they have to be, they have to make 80% AMI or below. So they are technically low income homeowners um, and they have to own their home. And so if they meet this, this criteria, we take their city violation and use it as a work scope. And we, um, we go down the list and we fix all the problems. And um, when we do this, we're working in partnership with the city and the city will forgive these homeowners fines. So that's a huge blessing for them because their, their home is fixed. They no longer have this, 
you know, emo emotional and financial burden of, of, of having fines levied upon them. Um, it doesn't always work so cleanly. Uh, many people's homes need much more uh, work than we can afford to give, uh, but we do what we can. Um, even if we're not able to, to fix everything, we do, do what we can. And this has been a, a wonderful project for us. Um, and we're so grateful for, for making it real because this is something that we wanted to do for years. Um, we've been talking about it for years. There was so little, there's so little places for low-income homeowners in our historic districts to go. Um, and, and we keep, we hear, we've heard it. We've heard it from the community for years. So the trust, the trust let us make it real, which was an incredible gift. Um, and we are also going to be joined later in the program by Leona Tate, who is um, working to uh, purchase and renovate the school that she helped integrate um, in 1960. It's an incredibly inspirational story, the McDonough 19 school, to turn it into a community center. And so she's going to update us on the progress of that in just a few minutes. But Brent, I say all this to kind of get back to the point of, I know the answer to this question, because in New Orleans, you have funded work for both homeowners, just mm -hmm. people's homes, and also iconic sites like McDonough 19. But can you talk a little bit about the balance between the fund, the, the projects that you fund in terms of you know, major sites of historic significance and then sites that matter to the community, um, you know, schools, homes, um, where mm -hmm. do you find that balance? Who really gets the money? Is it really the, most, the historic sites of the biggest importance that get the most funding or, or how do you find that balance? Yeah, that's a good question. And we're intentional about creating balance. So it's important that we support places that are of national and, and international significance. With Madonna, once that school was put on our, our radar, it almost felt like an injustice that that Leona Tate and the other two, you know, girls, now women, their their stories were overlooked given how instrumental. It was an understanding the American educational story. Nice. And so we saw it as an opportunity to, to expand the interpretation related to, to New, Orleans, New Orleans integration story, but also our national story. And there was there's nothing more inspiring when you have a Leona Tate. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, how rare is it to have the person that created the history now leading the effort to preserve it? So that was that was a no brainer for us. <laughs> and then your project. So we are looking for national models to fund. And when I read your proposal, and you just so beautifully described both the vision and the impact of this program, I wanted I wanted the action fund to to help realize this because when I think of the trim Tremaine neighborhood, I think of a, a rich and, and beautiful cultural legacy. Mm -hmm. When I think of New Orleans, of course, I think about the architectural history and, and, and the beauty of the, the historic built environment. But when I think of Treme, it is a social and cultural legacy that, that, over, that is greater than the architectural story. Yes. Well said. Right. So thinking that historic district designation would impact property owners because they're not maintaining the architecture to a certain standard felt like an injustice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It felt like this is why most Americans and the general public thinks preservation is, you know, a, a profession of no, yes. and they don't understand you know, that we have reimagined this work. So this was an opportunity to innovate and to create something new that other cities can replicate. And I've just been excited to see the progress. And I can only imagine the stories that you hear from the property owners. Oh, they're phenomenal. Um, yeah. We have um, a group of identical triplets um, who live in, in a home. It's just gorgeous, two-story, double gallery. Um, home in the Treme, just, you know, a prototypical um, Treme home, but they're just such a beautiful family. They are, so they're triplets who all live together, and then they're, they're grand, several, two of them are grandmothers, and so they have some of their children and grandchildren all living together in this home, and 
it's just, it's so wonderful. There's just so much joy coming out of that home. And so to be able to help families like that is just um, phenomenal. You know, we don't, we don't like to um, necessarily take pictures of the homeowners. We don't ever want people to feel like, you know, they're on display, but, but we do need promotional photos here and there. So we asked our homeowners, would any of you be willing to take some photos? They immediately volunteered and they decorated their porch. They put out like this cafe uh -huh. flowers. I mean, they were so proud and it was just so exciting. Um, so just, yeah, the, the, the relationships that we've been able to build through this program have been so meaningful. And, and thank you for saying that you think this could be a national model. We hope it, we hope it mm -hmm. is. We, we are planning to expand our program out of Treme to all of the historic districts in our city. Uh, there's almost 20. Mm -hmm. And we get calls every day now from people across the city saying, can you work in my neighborhood? Can you help me? And we can't yet, we're still focused on Treme. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, but we hope to expand soon. So, um, so thank you for making that possible. Um, and thank you for, for sharing two words that I think we need to hear more when it comes to kind of the black preservation or diverse preservation work, which is pride and joy. Mm -hmm. Yes. You know, there is black joy that, you know, we don't often get to hear and to see, but it exists, it's real. You just yes. described it. There is pride, yes. and and just understanding that that we can collaborate to provide fairly limited resources and investment to 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 support pride and joy, mm -hmm. and and to be able to make that citywide and then national. Yes, I would love for anyone that's listening to invest in the revival grants program. I just think there's just so much potential. Thank you, Brent. I love you. You're great. <laughs> this is fabulous. Um, you can do that, those of you watching, by going to givenola.org, search for the Preservation Resource Center, and help us on our Give NOLA Day fund, fundraising campaign today. Um, Brent, I'm thinking about the sites that, you know, where the injustice was done and they were lost either by neglect, years of neglect and finally torn down, or, you know, urban renewal sites. I mean, in New Orleans, through the Treme neighborhood came the, you know, the, the I-10 uh, overpass, which literally killed the most vibrant, thriving um, mm -hmm. Main Street in our city. Mm -hmm. um, it was a gorgeous, um, you know, neighborhood. Treme was an incredible neighborhood with, with Claiborne Avenue had the most live oak trees of any boulevard. Um, and it was, it was all destroyed um, with, by a Robert Moses Expressway. And mm -hmm. so, for sites like this that are gone, um, but have a story to tell, what do you think the best approach is? I mean, do plaques, do plaques cut it? <laughs> oh, that's, that's, a, that's a tough question. So with one of our grantees that's in Oklahoma City, the RFP, the title of it says, Preservation as Reconciliation, mm. because the impacts of urban renewal is a national issue. Almost every black, in particular urban neighborhood and community has experienced some form of, of injustice as it relates to, to public investment. And, and so in Oklahoma City, they had a neighborhood, it's the historic Deep Deuce neighborhood. It's where Ralph Ellison, who wrote um, Invisible Man, would write about his love for Deep Deuce, once thriving epicenter of Oklahoma City, both culture and commerce. And in the 50s, urban renewal decimated the commercial and residential community. And the only remnants that stand is related to the Luster Mansion or the Lyons family, four buildings. And so to help the city to make a repair and amends for urban renewal. The city's redevelopment authority purchased the vacant buildings at market value. We provided a planning grant for both community uh, engagement and then also business modeling for reuse. But the RFP for phase one says preservation as reconciliation. And this is the goal, is to use preservation in the moment as a form of equity 
or a pathway for equity and engage the community, rally the community and direct as much resources as possible to reactivating the, the last stand, standing remnants in deep dues. But most importantly, it's start to have the conversations about the loss of, of culture, the impact of cultural erasure, cultural and racial displacement, the, the loss of economic capital within the Black community, and the long-standing negative impacts of public policy and investments. And we have to find a solution to repair what has been lost. And preservation is just one kind of kind of spoke in a broader wheel of civic challenges that we need to be able to, to confront and, and to hold. And I think the, the power of what we do, the power of what we do is that that historic sites should be seen as safe spaces for having these difficult conversations. Yes, yes, totally. Welcome, Miss Tate. Thank you so much for joining us. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? It's good it's to so see you. So good to see you. Yeah, yeah, good to see you too. You too. Yeah. Um, Leona, before we, we pass it over to you, I'm going to ask Brent just one or two more questions, and then I'd love to talk about um, your center. So, um, Brent, you know, this is, it's so sad because every, like you said, every city in the country has projects like this that, that need funding. Um, are there one or two other projects that, that you could tell us about that have been particularly meaningful or impactful? I'm sure they all are. <laughs> um, but can you talk to, to us about one or two others across the country that have meant something special to you? Yeah. So for me, I, I would, Rosenwald Schools is really the kind of the, my foundational story. And, and for anyone like myself, I had read Booker T. Washington's autobiography, Up From Slavery. And I just thought, wow, this man was formerly enslaved, would establish an institution known as Tuskegee Institute at the time, known today as Tuskegee University. But I was so impressed that he would reclaim a, a former plantation site, build an HBCU, doing this as a response to a crisis in Black education, and that Tuskegee stands today as the physical manifestation of his bold ideas and, and vision for uplifting the Black community. So that for me was enough. But when I learned that, that he partnered with Julius Rosenwald, who at the time was the second president of Sears and Roebuck, he had a lot of empathy for the plight of African-Americans in the US being uh, Jewish American. And they collaborated and would help to fund the, the construction of over 5,000 school buildings in 15 Southern states, which is what we call Rosenwald schools today. And when I was in grad school, I had the good fortune to conduct the statewide inventory in Kentucky. And I learned that my mom and dad attended Rosenwald schools. Wow. And when I realized that the Rosenwald school that was standing up and I could touch it, and I realized that Booker T. Washington, in his mind, he envisioned you know, the school building program, a massive program, he partnered with Julius Rosenwald, that the buildings still stand meant that this gap between space and time was removed. Mm. And so I started to ask myself, what's my social responsibility to continue his legacy? How am I going to use my talent, my profession to uplift the black community? Because the work is ongoing and it's and it continues. And and so Rosenwald Schools is deeply rooted in both my professional and personal identity. And I'm delighted that we're collaborating with local and national partners to create the first national park in honor of a Jewish American. Mm. And the, the proposed park is the Julius Rosenwald or Rosenwald Schools National Historical Park. Oh my gosh, that's so exciting. Where will it be? So this would be a discontiguous national park boundary. 
So the idea is to identify three Rosenwald schools that highlights different school building periods and design. Mm -hmm. And it will be across the 15 states, so three schools in 15 states. And then also connecting to Chicago, which is where the Sears headquarter building still stands, where Julius Rosenwald was born in the uh, suburbs. So, wow, congratulations. Very exciting. That's so wow. Yeah. So that, I, I that for me, I, I was just going to say that for me is, is one, I know you asked for two, so I'll keep this short. And <laughs> which is, as I look at Leona, and we were just talking about you and, and as an action fund grantee, I just think it is it's so powerful and rare. You're, you're like a unicorn, which is to find the person that made history happen, who's actually leading the effort to preserve that history. And I have to say that I was like many Americans, I did not know the history of, of your school or your personal story. And, and once I discovered it, it's just like, you begin to understand the depths of erasure, the depth of, of the, the way that we tell stories and the way they get remembered. Because when I look at the Norman Rockwell painting and Ruby Bridges and how powerful that painting has been used as a tool for memory, cultural memory, to ensure that that story of integration lives on in perpetuity and how equally important stories related to school desegregation are forgotten. So a place that is dear to my heart and a place that I wanna see realized to its fullest glory is the Madonna. 19. Thank you. Yeah. You're here. Miss <laughs> mm. Tate, I'd like to formally introduce you um, to our viewers. Thank you so much for being here today. Miss um, Tate uh, was one of three girls in 1960 who helped integrate the McDonough 19 school, um, mm -hmm. along with Tessie Prevost and Gail Etienne. Um, and Ms. Tate, I'm just, I'm continually inspired and humbled by the fact that you had such an unthinkable sacrifice in those years and that you have, you have this drive, this incredible drive to continue to make this world a better place um, through the Leona Tate Foundation for Change. So thank you for all you do. Um, and I wanna give a plug. So we're plugging Give NOLA Day today, uh, give at givenola.org. But you can also, you don't just have to give to the Preservation Resource Center, please also give generously to the Leona Tate Foundation for Change, which mm -hmm. also you can find by searching on givenola.org. Um, so Ms. Tate, you, you established your Foundation for Change in 2009. Yes. Um, with the initial goal of purchasing the school. And mm -hmm. I just wondered, has your vision been the same this whole time or has it evolved? Well, my first um, vision was to just open it up as a school because in the lower ninth ward, there was only gonna be one school after Hurricane Katrina. Mm -hmm. um, but after finding out that, you know, the school board didn't no longer want it to be a school, I knew it needed to be something educational and um, something historical. Mm -hmm. um, it's just sad that a lot of people didn't know the history of McDonough 19. So what better place to put it was in that building. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we did purchase the building, um, my, um, the Leon T Foundation along with Olympic Community Development in January of two, um, 2020. Yes. That's so, very exciting. Congratulations. I know that was a long effort. Oh, yes. At that point. So that's amazing. Congratulations. Thank you so, so much. Can you tell us about where your project stands now? Um, what are the official plans for what the school will become? The building, um, I've always said and to Tessie and Gail that if I ever got my hands on that building, 
it will be named after the three of us. So it's now the Tate Etienne and Prevost Interpretive Center. Mm -hmm. And it's gonna feature um, from the, the reconstruction days, the, the segregation of public school days and, and other areas of civil rights that happened in New Orleans. We'll also have People's Institute joining us to continue their work on undoing racism. And um, we're holding a lot of workshops or planning a lot of programming in that, in, in that bottom area. The building is three stories high. The second and third floor will be affordable units for 55 or older. So we already accept an application. So if you know anybody, send them our way. <laughs> That's wonderful. Oh my gosh. Yeah, I love this. So Leona was a guest speaker at my advanced studio class at the University of Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. And we had the most amazing conversation. She was joined by Anasa, who is the ED of Claiborne Temple in Memphis, and then Varnell, who is the executive director of Sweet Auburn in Atlanta. But what I loved about Leona's project is it is leveraging historic tax credits and equity investment and is creating affordable housing. You know, it's, it's so funny if you read the New York Times or recent reports, you know, it's, it's pitting preservation against affordable housing advocates to yeah. say that, I mean, right, and, and maybe this is because the profession hasn't advocated or showed enough examples where we leverage existing buildings to create affordable housing or that commercial space is often occupied at 60%, and this is from our older, smaller, better publication, 60% of historic commercial spaces are occupied by minorities and women-owned businesses because it's more affordable versus new construction. So I just bring this up to say that what I love about Leona's project, the interpretive piece and leveraging that history as a tool to have a positive impact on people's lives today, that anti-racism training, all of the stuff that you just described, educating the public about the impacts of this cultural legacy, combined with the real estate and affordable housing. It's really an awesome project that I think has a lot of potential for being replicated in other communities. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's just ridiculous that it has taken you so very long um, to get the funding and the support you need. I mean, when you conceived of this idea in 2009, there should have been chariots at your doorstep with money to, to make this possible. And unfortunately, you know, that just wasn't the case. What sort of support have you gotten? Um, obviously, the National Trust has, has put their um, their faith behind you and their, and their financial support, um, you know, from the community level, the city level to national funders, um, who, who has been behind your work um, and supported it? The National Park Service has, has really been behind us, um, saving um, our treasures. Yep, saving those, America's treasures. Saving America's treasures, they've been a big part of it. Um, we've gotten some local grants and um, tax credits. Um, and really, that's that's where the funding is, is really coming from. I mean, I think the story of the building is, is really what helped us. But we, 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 we're fine as far as construction, but we're still fundraising for the, um, the exhibits that'll be on, on the, in the TEP Center. You know, uh, we're looking to find more funding for that so that we can really open up on time and uh, hopefully in August, we'll be ready. Mm -hmm. yeah. do, you have, um, do you have a group that you want to work with to develop these exhibits? Yes, we do. We're working with Gallagher, um, yes. And <laughs> that, right? <laughs> yes. Curious, Leona, about your, your staffing needs because mm -hmm. I, I, I know it's important to have the exhibition materials to tell the story inside space, but but it it won't happen if you don't have the people 
to be able to actually do do that. And I and I'm assuming you're mainly in an all volunteer position and are looking to move move the organization with full paid staff and professionals that can can do the work. Right, that's another need, operations. <laughs> and and we we really have good people that's really re working for nothing right now that'll move in with us. Um, we just need funding for operations and the, the design for the, the exhibit space. But um, we um, have someone that's really working with us. And I think she's in our audience today, Lydia Charles. And um, um, she has really, she's, this is, a, this is how her world. So she really know <laughs> how to work out of it. So we, you know, we're, com we're coming in. We, the people are there. We just gotta find the monies to bring them over into the new building once we go into the new building. Lydia actually um, put in our chat that if anyone would like to see the building in progress and get more information, mm -hmm. they can visit tepcenter.org. Oh, Thank yeah. you, Lydia. I'm curious if there are other iconic Black historic sites in New Orleans that's that's in need, similar to Madonna, or or even thinking at a broader neighborhood scale, like the issues that, that you all are addressing in Treme via the Revival Grant Program. What, what some of the other places and even the broader needs for, for preservation? Um, I know the African-American um, in Treme, um, they're looking for assistance in that, in that um, arena. Um, there are other ones, but they, they already have their sites, our Shea um, Cultural Center. Um, but the only one I know that's really working to under, you know, and under construction would be the African American Museum in Jermaine. Mm -hmm. uh, Reverend Brenda Square raised her hand and that reminds me that the Valina C. Jones School in, in the Seventh Ward neighborhood has been mm -hmm. empty for years. And yeah. the neighbors yeah. um, that was a site where, where you know black educators um, uh, there were just generations of excellence that came out of that school and there's so much love and pride for that school and the community wants it wants it restored to right. the purpose in the community right. and that's a huge one um, we also met recently with the owners of the SW Green mansion so um, mm -hmm. SW Green was the was a, a black millionaire in New Orleans I think the first um, incredible story of entrepreneurship, born into slavery, freed, um, amassed a fortune, built the Pythian Temple building in New Orleans. Um, personal home is falling apart. It was um, acquired by the state in um, 2010 and moved as part of the whole clearance of a neighborhood for the new VA hospital. Um, and it was unceremoniously dropped on a, a section of land. It was put down improperly. So it was for mm -hmm. years, it was unable to be restored. It's now owned by a couple who are dedicated to trying to figure out how to restore this building, make it a community center. What an incredible um, mm -hmm. historic site um, that needs to be, that needs attention and love and, and funding. Um, mm -hmm. So that's another one that is just, that's a, a shame that it's mm. that it's in the state. Yeah, it's just some, all this history in New Orleans, and somebody got to tell these stories. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What about the music, his, music thing? Because I I saw in the comment it was a Buddy Bolden house, and and I think when the just general public thinks of New Orleans, we think of food and music and architecture and culture, yeah. and and. What are some kind of iconic cultural spots in, in New Orleans that, that occupy historic buildings that might need some support? Um, I'm not, I'm, I know the jazz um, musicians is at the Mint. Um, I'm not sure if they wants to expand that or not. Um, mostly everything with the jazz or music and food is in the Treme area. You know, that's mm -hmm. mostly, I mean, we, have, we have 
a few sites um, in the Lower Ninth Ward that you know may have, and it's a some rest. It's a restaurant that may need some attention, and um, but things has been just shut down since COVID, and that's that's really the major thing. But um, <clears throat> and get back up and running the, at normal, and if anybody can help them get back up and running, it, it would be awesome. Yes. Um. You know, so many historic sites of bad significance have been torn down. Um, mm -hmm. Armstrong, um, we have a section of South Rampart Street that the Smithsonian Institute said it says is the most significant site for jazz history in the world, uh, because this was where Buddy Bold and Louis Armstrong, um, all of the, the early figures of jazz played, uh, really, you know, had crafted our very original American art form um, in these clubs. And we actually, the PRC actually acquired this year, this past year, um, the easement for Koi Theater. Um, and there are a few buildings left that have just been sitting. The Eagle Saloon, the Iroquois Theater, um, you know, Karnowski's Taylor Shop, but they, many of them were torn down. There are a few still standing and so, mm -hmm. Um, there are plans to restore them and we're very excited about that because to say that they were languishing is an understatement. They were hiding in plain sight for many years. Um, and unfortunately, Buddy Bolden's house is still is hiding in plain sight. It is a dilapidated shotgun in Central City um, that for years has languished and there is international attention on Buddy Bolden and his legacy and the site needs to be saved. Um, it's currently owned by um, PJ Morton, who's an amazing R&B artist. Um, and he has pledged to bring this uh, site, insert site back, uh, restore it, turn it into an art uh, music studio. So, you know, we're all very hopeful that he'll do it and he'll do it soon before <laughs> before more hurricanes come and, you know, more termites <laughs> swarm, scary. you know, all these ravages of, of New Orleans climate and, and environment. Uh, take yes. hold. Leona, are you imagining collaborating with artists mm -hmm. to help interpret the story? Yes, I am. Um, we, I, are going to collaborate with a with an artist to do a mural, and I want a mural done with all these civic civil leaders that came, you know, to help us get started, you know. And it, they, it, I have to have a spot for that, you know. It, it's just it's just a must, you know. They led the way, you know. They really led the way, and uh, we are going to have someone paint a mural for them. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. So I was part of a, a panel with Columbia University. They put on this program and I moderated a conversation with three black female artists. Mm -hmm. The title of the program was The Art of, of Preservation. And to hear how these artists and their interpretive kind of process and the way that they think about the history and the culture and then want to communicate that in space. Right. Just the the outcomes of their exhibitions and some were permanent others were short-term and you know temporary but i i am so glad to hear that you're thinking about art and artists as a way to help put some, some actual color right you know right. on on your on your storytelling and if you ever are looking to be connected with a couple of artists to think through that um i'm happy to help make intros appreciate you yeah Thank you so much yes Um, I wanna... I'm sorry. Our initial um, contact with the artist was to do the Black Lives Matter mural, which we wanted to paint in the street, but they call it as a highway. So we won't be able to put it there. Um, so hopefully we will find some area, either inside the building or outside somewhere that we can still do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's fantastic. Yes. I want to encourage anyone who has questions for Ms. Tate or for Brent to drop them in the chat box or the Q&A box. Um, we do have a question from Lenora. She says, why isn't there an main type of program to rest historic sites from owners who don't or won't renovate 
and make sites accessible to the public. Oh my gosh, if only there were. <laughs> oh, right, Ex exactly. If, if I would love a tool like that. I would be flying around to cities and taking back black landmarks. And But, you know, it's, it's we are in a, a land use laws are real, personal property laws are real. And so it would be very difficult for us to, to use eminent domain in a sweeping kind of way like that. We've explored those kind of conversations. I kind of the last time for me was when I was working on Joe Fraser's gym in Philly. And, you know, we got involved because the the property owner, they they purchased the property in foreclosure the year that he passed away. He had owned it for four decades. It was not only his gym, but it was his partly his home. And most importantly, it was a safe haven for youth in the community because he was a surrogate father. Yeah. The many. And and so the new property owners put up scaffolding to remove his name that's etched in stone on the front facade. And we thought that that was a disgrace and so disrespectful. And so we we rallied and we used local landmark designation to protect the building from demolition, those kind of adverse alterations, uh, worked in, in, in other ways. But there was a, a boxer that wanted to step in and become the real estate developer and to return it back to the community as a community space. And we were exploring every option possible, including the use of eminent domain as a way to just, you know, kind of recover the building and, and couldn't make that work. So I, this is a very long way of me saying, I, I see the, the value in the idea. It just would be impossible to, to make happen. We hear stories um, from cities across the country whose, um, you know, city departments um, just cannot seem, for whatever reason, lack of funding, lack of, lack of staffing, uh, cannot seem to actually follow through with <laughs> citations of um, neglected property. The, the buildings will be cited and then whether they're even actually fined or whether it actually ever moves to adjudication. Um, it just never happens. And so unfortunately, you know, that that's true many times in New Orleans too. And, and like Brent said, here in New Orleans, we also can make a site a local landmark and that protects it to some degree. But if the property owner doesn't have the will or the desire to save a place, there's, there's not a lot you can do in, a, in um, you know, with the laws that we have. So, very hard. Um, uh, I want to encourage everyone in our last few minutes, if you have any comments or questions for Brent or for Ms. Tate, um, to drop them in the question and answer the chat box. And don't forget to support the Preservation Resource Center and the Leona Tate Foundation for Change by going to givenola.org and making your donation. Um, Brent and Leona, I'd love to get, you know, just any initial thoughts. Um, President Biden in his uh, recent Address to the nation um, talked about the need to invest heavily in our nation's infrastructure. And one of the two examples he cited was the removal of the uh, Claiborne uh, overpass, mm -hmm. uh, Claiborne Avenue here in New Orleans, uh, which we talked about a few minutes ago, that decimated Treme during the urban renewal period in the 50s and yeah. 60s. And this is going to be a kind of painful process because people have so many different um, feelings about whether the overpass should now come down. It devastated the neighborhood, mm -hmm. but the community reclaimed the space. And underneath the overpass, there are, every weekend there's parties, cookouts, <laughs> uh, Mardi Gras Indians, um, uh, the masking culture practice um, and um, perform under the, under the overpass. And it's now a part of the community too. And yes. so, it's gonna be a difficult conversation. Um, Ms. Tate, I was wondering if you had any thoughts on the overpass removal now that it's a, a subject of national discussion. I know, I, I can remember when when it started, um, before they, when they were building it, I had some family friends that house, they had to give their house up because, because of that. Um, tearing it down, I don't know, it's open area under there now, you know, so. You know, I don't know. It's six one way, half a dozen another way. It's going to be confusing because 
it allows the traffic freer than, than it used to be just on that one one street, but we'll, we'll see, you know, um, maybe they can reroute it another way, but um, just, it, it's straight through the city, really, it's straight through the city. And in, in especially residential area. I, I just am concerned about the the impact of removing that kind of infrastructure, and I feel like that it's a little distracting from the the bigger conversation. Is is we want to advocate for cultural infrastructure investment because our nation's cultural infrastructure, like Madonna nineteen has not had federal and public investment to, to ensure that this cultural asset is preserved and well-maintained. And there are hundreds, if not thousands, and when we look at telling the full American story, including the spaces that represent women and Latino Americans and Asian Americans and LGBTQ and Native American and, 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 and others, that's a lot of cultural infrastructure repair work that needs to happen. And, and I think that would be a tremendous and smart investment that communities could rally around. Love that. I love yeah. that. Yeah. yeah. It is. Uh, I want to just relay to you, Ms. Tate, uh, that uh, Brenda Square put in the comments here that um, we receive letters from people all over the world during the time, or that you all receive letters from people all over the world when you integrated those schools. And wouldn't that be, because wouldn't it be wonderful to have some of those salvaged items reproduced by local artists in the museum? The cards express support for the students and were reaction to the reactions to the widespread protest and anger. Yes, um, right now they're at um, Historic New Orleans Collection. Oh, fascinating. Okay. Yeah, we uh, donated some years ago to them and um, they have an exhibit there for those letters. Um, we will be showing them. I don't think we'll have them touchable in, 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 at the TEP Center, but uh, we will have something, you know, I don't know if we'll do it on video or we're gonna do it as a, as a, as a part of the, the exhibit, but um, we will be having some there. That's great. Uh and then someone mentioned someone needs to save the Perseverance Society Hall. And that's another, that's a good point, Brent, that we have these culture aid um, um, uh, organizations that had um, halls throughout the city to help um, African-American residents. They were places of um, wonderful support, culture, um, mm -hmm. insurance. You could, um, it really places of black business before people were allowed to do that, you know, in more formal institutions. Um, these, there are halls still left standing that need help across New Orleans um, that are still being run by these societies all these you know, decades, a century later. Um, so those are amazing sites of significance as well. Excellent. Yeah, so I can get more information on those to you. Um, thank you both so much. It has been such an honor speaking with both of you. Um, and I'm just so grateful for your time and for all the work you all are doing. You're truly making our world a better place. Thank you. Thank you, Danielle. Good see you. I just want to say thank you, Leona, for your leadership, your vision, and, and Danielle, likewise, for the Revival Grant Program and all that you're doing in Treme and across the city. Yeah. Thank you both so much. Um, don't you. forget to give. Give Nola Day, the yeah, Tate Foundation Nola Day. <laughs> in the PRC. We, we really appreciate your support. Brent, thank you for what you're doing. I'm just so inspired by, by your work and this team. Yeah. And uh, keep an eye out. I'm going to make a $50 donation to both organizations. <laughs> thank you. That's great. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Personal donations, not action fund. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Love it. Yes. Have a great 504 day. Give Nola a day. Take good care. Thanks for joining us. Bye bye.